were here about to start the George syndrome. Okay, we covered some syndromes, Wishcott, Outreach, <coughs> Ataxia, Telangiectation, several uh, things, severe combined immunodeficiency. Okay, remember when you have this condition, both the T and the B cells are going to be impaired. <coughs> and you can guess everything that can happen. This is one of the conditions that presents with an absent timing shadow. No, some people can have a timing shadow and this doesn't rule out. Um, SCID. I'm repeating that because now we are going to study another syndrome that also can present with an absent timing shadow. And this is the George syndrome. This is a chromosomal disorder in which there is a deletion of part of the chromosome 22nd. Okay. And it's called, also called velocardiofacial syndrome. Okay. Because it has some abnormalities in the face, in the heart. It causes neurological defects, causes immunodeficiency, endocrinologic disorders, and also cognitive deficiencies. Okay, these people present with cardiac abnormalities, a hypoplastic thymus, that's why these people don't have a time shadow, and they present with hypocalcemia. So, you have a problem with the T cells. These people don't have a thymus, so they are not likely to make too many T cells. T cells impairment, okay, and they also lack the parathyroid glands. So if you measure the hormone that the parathyroid glands produce, PTH, <coughs> it's going to be low. And since the function of this hormone is to elevate the calcium, the calcium is likely to be very low as well. Okay, low calcium. Plus the cardiac problems, the neurocognitive impairment, failure to thrive, okay, the facial abnormalities. That gives you what is called the George. Because if, you, if people don't have a, a, a thymus, I'm referring to the shadow, can be the George or can be severe combined immunodeficiency. In that case, people have problems with the T cells and the B cells. Cellular and humoral immunity. Okay? Because you can have different vignettes. It's very easy to, to give you a very clear vignette. Okay, and you recognize this is the George syndrome. But the questions can be asked. Um, on a routine, oh, well, if a kid is born and in an examination because the kid has a respiratory pressure or something, um, the PA notices that there is no timing shadow. Which of the following can be the, they can put severe combined immunodeficiency or they can put the George syndrome. Okay, so you have to look for values, calcium, PTH, cellular immunity problems, or a severe combined immunodeficiency with both altered. And the calcium level will be normal here. The PTH level will be normal here. Okay? So, <coughs> many defects, okay? Variable clinical manifestations, depending on what is more affected, learning disabilities, congenital malformations, and you're going to see the facial characteristics of these people. Okay, this uh, deletion in the chromosome 22 will produce hemicygosity. Remember what that means? If we have one part of a chromosome deleted, okay, that means we lack all of the information there. Okay, so even though these genes by themselves could be recessive, now they behave as autosomal because we don't have the good copy. Okay, like, like dominant because we don't have the good copy. So they are hemizygous for all of the information that is present there. Okay, there is hemizygosity for at least 30 genes, including this one, PBX1, which is 
a key transcription factor for the development of the pharyngeal arches. Okay, if you want to know what are the pharyngeal arches, you have to look for uh, knowledge about embryology. Okay, when we are embryos, we look like a fish or like a reptile. <laughs> okay, that have uh, these structures here that are in the area that will be the pharynx, the neck, etc. Later in life, are called pharyngeal arches. Okay. From each of them, several external and internal structures are going to develop. Some of them stay in the same position that you see there. Some of them migrate, move up and down, okay, depending on what structure they are going to make. Okay, so there is a mess in the development of these pharyngeal arches that results in cardiac abnormalities, okay, in immunologic abnormalities because the thymus uh, is develops from these pharyngeal arches. Also, they have cleft and uh, palate and, and cleft lip, hypoparathyroidism, because the parathyroid glands also develop from there, and also some disorders uh, like cognitive disorders, learning disabilities, and even schizophrenia. Okay. Several conditions can appear from there. Also, autoimmune conditions can appear that depends on the level of T cell light lymphopenia that these patients have. It's just for you to see, just for you to see what the pharyngeal arches are. So, uh, the findings in the George syndrome are cyanosis, depending on the cardiac abnormalities, a murmur, heart failure, and some characteristic facial features that you're gonna see later, a picture that appear in most patients. Bullows, nose tip, prominent ears, okay, less prominent as the child gets older. They have cleft lip and palate, growth failure. Now that I see this growth failure, see, uh, failure to thrive, remember in vignettes we have to recognize certain words or certain phrases that will lead us to think about what is the li uh, most likely like, diagnosis. Okay, when we talk about immunodeficiencies, the key word is recurring infections. Okay, persistent and recurring infections. If someone has a pneumonia, someone has an otitis media or two or something, that's normal for everybody. But when a vignette says persistent and recurrent infections that don't respond to treatment, okay, you, have, you have to think in immunodeficiencies. And when you see growth failure, failure or failure to thrive, you have to think in something that is congenital. This appear since the very beginning of life. So there have been this kid had difficulties growing and has a shorter stature for the age, or is shorter than the average of the, uh, of the population. A growth failure, seizures or tetany, as a result of low calcium, okay, as, as a result of the brain uh, abnormalities. They don't have any verbal <coughs> disorder, a verbal le learning disorder. Mm -hmm. Um, there's more problem with maths than with language. Please don't feel bad, anybody. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have any George syndrome. That's also a normal finding in the population. <laughs> math, difficulties in math. Frequent infections as a result of the immunodeficiency, speech delay, feeling difficulties. <coughs> but I guess every, anybody that has cleft palate, lip palate, uh, cleft lip, will have feeding difficulties. Plus all of the malformations as a result of this uh, disorder in the pharyngeal arts. Okay, there you have uh, the classical phase of a kid with the George syndrome. Okay, they will have the eyes are gonna be separate. Okay, and you measure the distance between the pupils is gonna be wider than in the rest of the population. Notice the, the base of the nose, how it's wider than the tip. Okay, this distance between this and this. Hyperterrorism, hooded eyelids, very characteristic eyelids, the short philtrum, philtrum is this structure between the nose and the upper um, lip, okay? Fish mouth appearance, micronesia, that is a, a small nose from top to bottom, but small, low set ears, okay? They have Telecanthus with short palpebral fissures, 
that I can't resist the distance between here and here. Okay. And these are some examples. Notice also uh, that doesn't appear in the first slide the malformation in the ears. Okay, the ears also form from these pharyngeal arches. Okay, so they can have malformations. They know this mouth, the separate eyes, the ears that are implanted low. Okay. And also this is exactly the same slide that we mentioned before. There is no thymic shadow. Okay. But in this case the manifestations are gonna be different. Notice how from one single sign, okay, you can develop a, di a differential diagnosis. Okay, and this is what we ask you in the OSCIS, for example, when you see things like this, what is the differential that you are considering? Well, I have to consider a CID and I have to consider uh, the George syndrome. Or what test are you going to order? Well, I need calcium levels, I need this, I need that, and depending on the history, if they have dysfunction in the humoral and cellular immunity, is more likely SCID, and if they have dysfunction only in the T cell activity, it's more likely um, B. George. Well, to mention uh, one innate immune disorder, remember innate immunity is the one that has to do more with inflammation, with uh, phagocytosis, with recognition of antigens by the dendritic cells, phagocytic cells, uh, macrophages problems with fever, all of the innate uh, immune response disorders. They're going to mention something that is called chronic granulomatous disease. <coughs> it's a rare disorder, okay, that um, is caused by genetic defects in the components of a complex that is called the NADPH oxidase complex. Okay. If you Google that, you are going to find a series of proteins and, and enzymes that work together doing seven alchemical reactions <coughs> okay, that have the objective of helping phagocytic cells to destroy pathogens. Okay? This is responsible for the optimal phagocyte killing because they produce superoxide. We have a machine. We have mentioned a lot about the damage that superoxide radicals produce to our tissues. Well, some of our tissues produce, in a very <coughs> controlled way, superoxide to destroy bacteria. Okay, so this enzyme, or this complex of enzymes, is the responsible for this. Production of superoxide and regulation of the content within the phagosome. Remember, a phagosome is this vesicle that traps the bacteria and engulfs the bacteria, that then has to be fused with the lysosome for the bacteria to be killed. Okay, forming what is called the phagolysosome that will take care of the rest. When people have deficiencies in this uh, production of superoxide, they will suffer recurring serious bacterial and fungal infections. And notice what pathogens we are mentioning there, Staphylococcus aureus, Aspergillus, Nocardia, Serratia marcescens, and Burkholderia sepacia. Okay. And also an abnormal inflammatory response that will result in granuloma formation. Okay, notice that we have a different set of pathogens here. Okay, we have a staph, but we have other pathogens, fungi, etc., and some pathogens that we have not mentioned before. Because normally the um, innate immunity is the one that takes care of these pathogens. Okay, we don't need a uh, more than a good innate immunity and a good phagocytic complex in order to fight this bacteria or these pathogens. So there is a failure to undergo oxidative burst that renders neutrophils and macrophages unable to kill microbes. That means microbes can live within the macrophages, can um, live inside the phagosomes, and can live forever inside the cells and mul multiply. Okay, this will produce a chronic infection with repeated inflammation that will cause extensive granuloma formation in the skin, in the lungs, in the lymph nodes, liver, bones, that can even produce obstruction in the GI tract or genital urinary tracts. Many granulomas all over the body. Okay, there are 
some kind of neuromatous diseases uh, that can appear in adults. Remember, we are talking about something that is inherited, okay? They will have recurrent infections with these uh, pathogens. They can present with a perianal abscess, pneumonias, obstruction of the genital urinary tract. So they can present with flank pain. Okay, they can present with uh, kidney failure as a result of the obstruction. If we produce an obstruction to the outflow of urine, they are going to develop a condition that is called hydronephrosis, in which there is an increased pressure inside the kidneys that compresses the normal structures of the kidney, destroying them. They can present with skin infection, urunculs that are warm, painful, post fail in petigo, chronic lymphadenopathy, fever, sinusitis, poor growth, skin scarring because of the multiple infections. Okay, there you have some examples. Okay, you have here uh, some granulomas on the skin. Okay, uh, this is an elision, this an infiltrated patch. It's warm, has altered temperature sensitivity. Okay, there is a chronic gran granulomatous dermatitis with fibrinoid necrosis and a thickened nerve that you can that you can observe here in the histologic image. There is also this one here, frontotemporal erythematose, an infiltrative patch that has well-defined borders. And here you see what is a granuloma and the definition. The granuloma is a compact collection of mature mononuclear phagocytes, macrophages, and epithelioid cells. These macrophages, when, when they are, try to destroy bacteria. The bacteria survived inside them and started divide them inside them, and they simply are kept there uh, collecting <coughs> bacteria that are still growing inside. They are characteristic of some diseases, sarcoidosis, for example, beryliosis, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, okay, some <coughs> drug reactions, <coughs> leprosy, Crohn disease, tuberculosis, rheumatoid nodules, etc. So all of those lesions are granul granulomas. What is the incidence? One in 200,000 people, 70% of them have an X-linked condition. The other 30% are autosomal recessive. And then we get to HIV infection. Well, HIV infection is probably one of the most important epidemics that started the last century, in the 70s. There are many theories about the origin. Mm, nobody knows. Yeah, probably it was affecting people for many decades, because when people, when epidemiologists look back, they know about cases that were described in the 20s. Certain people in certain countries that have that were described as having a disease that was very similar to AIDS. When they put things together, they realized this disease has been going on for several decades before it was discovered. Okay? And surely in poor countries, like in Africa, it was spreading for a long time, producing a lot of damage without anybody taking care of this, okay? It was when the disease started affecting developed countries and famous people started dying that people started taking care of this, okay? As I was telling someone is able to pay, everybody is able to investigate and to invest resources in finding out what's going on. <coughs> We're gonna be talking about this, what is the difference between HIV, infection and AIDS, progression of the disease, Okay. We're going to be talking about the virus itself, okay, the viral enzymes, about the pathogenesis, transmission. Okay, you are going to know certain things about the transmission that you will know, but you don't want to tell maybe this too much to the patients, so they don't get too much, um, what is the word? Uh, no, no, no. Um, but they stop taking care. Okay. 
they feel too confident <coughs> because HIV is not transmitted very easily. In fact, it's a very, very, very inefficient virus. Okay? But the virus is produced in thousands of thousands per second, but only a very, very tiny proportion is a viable virus. Okay? <coughs> and there have to be certain things for the infection to occur. And you're going to see the proportion of cases that is that are, or the risk of transmission of the infection. Okay? But when you know that, this doesn't mean that we are not going to take care. Okay? We have to take care of not getting any disease as if the risk of transmission is 100%. Okay? So we are going to be talking about this and other things about this virus. Okay? It's a pandemic. Remember when an epidemic goes beyond uh, a country or a geographic area but it's endemic, it is considered a pandemic, it has a very great impact mostly on underdeveloped countries than in developed ones and it's caused by a retrovirus. <coughs> <coughs> Try to explain that again. Remember, normally the genetic information goes from DNA to RNA to protein. Normally, we don't have any way of making the reverse process. Okay? There is no way that we can make DNA from RNA. Okay? Now, the HIV contains RNA. This is what infects us viral RNA. The HIV has an enzyme that converts the viral RNA into viral DNA. Okay? In reverse. That's why it's called a retrovirus. And there is an enzyme that is called reverse transcriptase that is the one that makes this process. Okay? So infects and replicates human lymphocytes and macrophages Okay, because are the cells that contain a receptor for the virus. Okay. And of course, if you remember what is the role of the CD4 cells, which are central to the immune system, you understand that when we don't have enough of them, all of the immune system fails. First, the uh, cellular immunity and then the tumoral immunity as well. <coughs> Because if the B cells don't have someone stimulating them, they also fail. During the first years of the infection, patients are able to um, compensate the lack of CD4 cells with an increase in the number of CD8 cells, okay, an increase in other parts of the immune system. But there is a moment when, because of the lack of stimulation, the CD8 cells start failing as well. Okay, so at the end, people enter into the process that is called AIDS. That is when the CD4 count goes below 200, or when people have any of the AIDS-defining diseases, like cancers, pneumocystis, uh, girovechi, carinine pneumonia, or Kaposi sarcoma, or any of the others. Okay. This culminates in an immune incompetence and susceptibility to opportunistic infections and malignancies. This is the classification of the virus, genus, lentivirus, family, retrovilidae. And there are two subtypes. The type one, that is the one that is producing the pandemics. Okay. There are different uh, classes, etc. The class B is more common in Europe and USA. And the type two, that is more common in West Africa. This is not related to pandemics. It's less pathogenic. And it's not as aggressive as the HIV one. Of course, there are tests for, two, for both of them. AIDS normally results as a result of HIV infection. And it's interesting, if you go and you Google HIV doesn't produce AIDS, you are going to find a lot of people trying to disprove that HIV produces AIDS. And they recommend that people that have HIV infection don't take any of the medications because AIDS results from something else. Okay. Even nowadays, uh, uh, we have people who 
try to deny the scientific evidence and try to go <coughs> against scientific evidence, trying to say that this is corporate interest, that this is the pharmaceutical industry, that this is the government of the United States, or many different things. Okay, neglecting totally the evidence and making people uh, stop the treatment and having a very, very bad outcome. Okay, so results of HIV infection normally after six to nine years, depending on the patient, okay, there are cases, very rare cases, of people dying of an acute viremia okay, weeks after the infection with HIV. There are cases that progress to AIDS in two, three years, and some cases that never progress to AIDS. Okay? Certain percentage of the patients that are HIV infected are progress very slowly or never progress to AIDS, and these are, of course, under investigation. We need to know the why. So AIDS produces a constellation of infections, malignancies, etc., as a result of the immune depression. <coughs> this is the structure of the HIV. Notice that it has a capsid called nucleocapsid. It's not a nucleus at all, but it's a nucleocapsid. It's, a, it's where the genetic material is located and is surrounded by proteins. Okay, all of those proteins have names. The nucleocapsid of the virus is called P24, or the proteins that form part of it. Inside the nucleocapsid, there are two strands of RNA, viral RNA, and there are some enzymes. One of them is the reverse transcriptase. Remember, it's the one that makes this process, RT. The other one is the integrase. It's the one that cuts the viral DNA and or cu sorry, cuts the human DNA and inserts the viral DNA inside our DNA, integrase, integration. And then there is one that is called protease. Okay? When the virus starts replicating and, and the, our cells make copies and copies and copies of the virus, it makes very long proteins that have to be cut to make the virus. Imagine you make a long chain of P24. Okay? The protease will cut, will cut the long chain in tiny pieces that will form the capsid of the virus. The same with other proteins. The gly gly glycoprotein 441, glycoprotein 120, P17, and different other proteins have to be cut to make a new virus. Okay, it's important to know this because we are going to use in patients a combination of medications that each of them will inhibit one of the different processes. We have reverse transcriptase, transcriptase inhibitors, protease inhibitors, integrase inhibitors, entry inhibitors, okay, medications that block the attachment or the binding of the viral proteins to the human cells. And this highly active antiretroviral therapy is made by a combination of three or more of these medications with different mechanisms of action. Why we need this combination? Because the virus, this enzyme, reverse transcriptase, is a very bad enzyme, okay? It makes copies of the, uh, of the RNA of the virus, but this enzyme doesn't take care of making the copies properly, okay? Every time this enzyme makes a copy, makes a different copy. Doesn't care of the order. And it doesn't have any proofreading activity. It doesn't take the time of going back to repair the RNA. That's why most of the viruses that are produced don't serve at all, are useless. But the ones that are useful, the ones that work, all of them have a different structure in the RNA. So all of them are totally different. Okay, so it's very easy that this virus is constantly mutating, 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 and the antibodies that we make against the virus don't work at all. Because we have a different virus every time. And it's very easy that if you use only one medication, several of these copies create resistance to the medication. That's why we have to use several or a combination of medications to make sure we destroy all of the, co all of the copies by a different mechanism. And we create as fewer resistant strains as possible. OK, so there is a nucleocapsid that contains two strands of RNA, contains the enzymes. OK, then we have this uh, envelope. By the way, this envelope most of the is made by a double uh, layer of lipids. The virus takes this from our cell membranes. Okay? And it's surrounded by some proteins. 
glycoproteins, GP41, GP120, that have the function of attachment and entry into the cells. Okay, you're going to see how these uh, GP120, GP41 interact with the cell receptors in the CD4 cells okay, in order to infect. There is an animation. Okay? Let me see if it's not too long. Center, it has two copies of RNA. It's a typical retrovirus, meaning that it has an outer envelope. And in the center, it has two copies of RNA, as well as an enzyme here in blue that's reverse transcriptase, which will ultimately turn that RNA into DNA. Um, the, the virus itself, with this outer envelope protein, uh, actually directly infects T helper cells. The way that it does this is that as it comes up to the cell surface, it uses receptors that are on T helper cells and exclusive to T helper cells, which are CD4 molecule, which really defines T helper cells. It's a surface receptor that binds to the envelope protein. It, that causes a conformational change and allows a second receptor to grab hold of the envelope. This is the chemokine co-receptor. It's also called CCR5, and we'll talk about that more. What happens now is that the, the, the stalk of the envelope protein pierces through the, uh, from the virus into the, into the host cell and starts to draw the two cell membrane, the cell membrane and the viral membrane together. And what ultimately happens is fusion of those two membranes and the viral genetic material is injected essentially into the cell and the envelope protein is left at the cell surface. The virus has a matrix and a capsid protein shown here in green and red that, that essentially are digested when it enters into the cell. That releases viral enzymes and the viral RNA. And here we have reverse transcriptase, which takes the viral RNA and using host nucleotides, converts that viral RNA into a single strand of DNA. While it does that, it makes some random errors, which is characteristic of reverse transcriptase. It has very poor proofreading activity. That single-stranded DNA now is again reverse transcribed into a double-stranded DNA. At that point, another enzyme that has come in with the virus in the beginning called integrase essentially grabs hold of that double-stranded DNA and carries it through a nuclear pore into the nucleus of the cell. Within the nucleus of the cell, it finds the host chromosome, and it basically, the integrase enzyme, makes a nick in the host DNA and allows for HIV to insert itself into the host chromosome. And that right there is what establishes lifelong infection. Now, RNA polymerase comes along and makes messenger RNA. Those messenger RNAs encode for different viral proteins. They end up associating with ribosomes on the, at the surface of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And here's a piece of mRNA that's making envelope protein, which is directly produced into the endoplasmic reticulum. And it's shuttled then through the endoplasmic reticulum and taken to the cell surface, where at the cell surface, it becomes embedded in the cellular membrane and at this point, coalescing with other envelope proteins that have been produced, you have this cluster of envelope proteins now on the surface of this infected cell. At the same time, there are other messenger RNAs that are being produced that allow for translation of other uh, viral proteins. So here are additional viral proteins being made, which are going to be used to make up the key components that, uh, that the virus ultimately is going to need. These are transported again to the cell surface to the area where these envelope proteins are, and a strand of RNA as well as a, some of the enzymes are part of that complex. This then buds off at the cell surface at this point, but it's still not a mature virion because 
the polyprotein chain needs to still be digested into its component parts. That's done by an enzyme called protease. Protease breaks up those uh, polyprotein chains and ultimately allows for them to coalesce and form the mature uh, structures that make up the final virion. And now you have a mature infectious virion that can go on now to infect other cells. Once that happens now, the cell can produce tons of viruses, and this is really what then keeps the whole process going. Okay. So there you have, a, first you have the attachment, okay, the attachment for it to happen, two things are necessary, a receptor, which is the CD4 protein. I remember the CD4 is the one that allows the contact between the CD4 cells, okay, when they receive, uh, when they are presented with an antigen, okay, in the, in the MHC2 class molecule, this CD4 receptor uh, reinforces this attachment between the T cell receptor and the antigen presenting cell. So this CD4 receptor is used by the HIV virus together with the core receptor that is called CCR5. You may have heard about people who never get infected with HIV, okay? And this is occurs, this occurs because of a mutation that they have in this core receptor, okay? There is no disease associated with, or at least no disease that we know associated with the mutation in the CCR5, but they have an advantage, okay? They never get infected uh, with HIV. So, they're lucky, okay? They're lucky that they have uh, this mutation that doesn't produce any condition. Yeah. Um, so, so, um, so these people who are like immune, they can still be infectious to other people. Uh, if they are not infected, they are not infectious. Okay. Remember, for this virus to succeed, this virus has to enter inside the cell and start reproducing. Don't confuse this with the slow progressors. Okay. This is not exact. This is not the same as the slow progressors. Slow progressor is people who are infected. They have the HIV in the lymph nodes, living inside the lymphocytes. But this HIV reproduces very slowly and never destroys the population of CD4, so they don't progress to AIDS. And they are infected and they transmit the condition. These people who don't get infected, they can do whatever they want, have an injection of blood of someone with HIV, and they don't get infected because there is no entry of the virus inside the cells. Okay. Is that the Delta 32? Is that the mutation? Mm -hmm. And these people are like Europeans, right? Because of the bubonic Most plague and they have, they have like an innate resistance? Right? Yeah, because they have this mutation. Right? In some cases, mutations. This would be one of the silent mutations that we have many silent mutations because they don't represent disease. But in this case, this represents an advantage for this person. Don't have a disease, but at the same time, don't get another. It's like an evolutive advantage. Like uh, sickle cell disease is uh, it's a, it's an advantage for people who live in malaria areas, or thalassemia, etc. This is an advantage that at the same time doesn't produce any, any, any disease, okay, that we know. Professor, can they, can they find out in advance that they have the mutation? So they will be... They can <laughs> find it. That's Are you going to pay for the research? <laughs> That's a good news for them. They can. Of course, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no. What probably they are investigating is how, I, I imagine, how to transmit the mutation to other people. If you can do a genetic engineering and modify the DNA of a person and create a mutation, that would be great. Okay, so we can have people who are resistant. Not only to HIV, to different infections. Imagine that you discover why some people never get the flu. And you make the mutation and it, to everybody. No more flu. And no more flu vaccine. <laughs> so there you have the attachment, the push fusion of the envelope of the virus with the cell membrane on coating. Okay, the same thing that you saw in the video. And then you have the integration and watch the video if you want to really understand 
watched the video a couple of times. So now these, these are statistics uh, probably I have to update because they are from last year. Okay, 35 million infected worldwide. Notice that almost 25 million are in sub-Saharan Africa. Most of them, the Caribbean is the most heavily affected region of the world after Africa. In the US we have 47,000 diagnoses of infection we had in 2013. 80% of those were among adult and adolescent males. Men who have sex with men were 65% of all newly diagnosed HIV infections. Okay, most of these infections occur in blacks and Latins, not too much in Caucasians. Okay, I was reading about these uh, why this occurs and looks like there is a cultural issue that has to do with the education of Latins uh, about the machismo, etc. <laughs> that is correlated with having unprotected sex. Okay? Hard to understand. <laughs> In Africa, the transmission is predominantly heterosexual. Okay? Women comprise 60 to 70 percent of those living with HIV. Uh, theology, uh, theology, we don't have to talk again about HIV, but uh, the transmission is important. can be transmitted via blood products, sexual fluids, and other fluids containing blood, breast milk, etc. The transmission, okay, unprotected sexual contact, any type, okay, uh, even though it is not, or it is difficult to demonstrate Oral sex also can transmit HIV, okay? Uh, even if the person, uh, mostly if the person has any wound in the mouth, any ulcer, bleeding gums, uh, etc., Can be transmitted before birth or during, during delivery, okay? Um, breastfeeding as well and sharing contaminated needles and syringes. Notice that the risk of transmission per exposure is low, okay, estimates are on the order of 0.1% per contact if there is no anal sex, okay? There is no anal sex, only 1%, so, sorry, 0.1%, so one every 1,000, average. This is what I don't want to tell you to tell, you, to, tell to your patients. <laughs> so they continue taking care. <laughs> you can tell this once they come to you, oh, I think, I, oh, wait, 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 and not before, okay? Then you have the transmission when there is anal sex, okay? Depending on the per if the person is circumcised or not, okay? Notice that for people who are circumcised, the transmission is one out of 100 sexual encounters. If there is no circumcision, it is one out of 161. So circumcision prevents a lot of diseases. Okay, circumcision prevents and prevents diseases in women as well. Okay, because in countries where circumcision is done regularly for religious reasons, for example, the incidence and prevalence of cervical cancer is very, very, very low. Human papilloma virus is transmitted transmitted from the males to the females uh, in the in the previous. Okay, so if there is circumcision, the risk of sexually transmitted infections decreases very importantly. Okay, notice that the highest risk is for the receptive partner in sexual and anal intercourse with ejaculation. Okay, one in 70 compared to one in 154 without ejaculation. So this doesn't protect, okay? Very important amount of But the good thing is that it's not always, okay? So the virus has to enter the cells. Entry is using the CD4 receptor and the co-receptor, okay? Reverse transcriptase is the one that makes the DNA from the viral RNA. It's an error-prone enzyme. Produces high rate of HIV mutation. That's why antibodies don't protect. Once there is integration, 
what is integrated is called a provirus. This provirus can stay dormant for many years, okay, living in the nucleus of infected cells. That's why it's impossible when HIV infection started, they, treat, they, they try to do several procedures like heating the blood, like changing the blood of people, but it's impossible to find something that is inside the nucleus of the lymphocytes in the lymph nodes. It's impossible unless you remove all of the lymph nodes of the body. <coughs> would be the only way. Once integrated, can be dormant for very high periods of time. Okay, a few weeks after the infection, you're gonna find in the blood a very high level of viral replication, viremia, and even there are some cases described of death because of an acute HIV vi viremia. This can exceed 10 million viral particles per microliter of plasma. Imagine how many viruses. And also, at the same time that the virus increases, there is a decrease, an acute decrease in the CD4 count. Okay, the initial response to infection is genetically determined. Normally, the CD8 and antibodies control the infection <coughs> during the, set, the first years of the infection. And you have this percentage of patients, 5%, that are slow progressors. Okay, they are being carefully studied, trying to <coughs> make the HIV infection to become a chronic disease that doesn't need too much medication and those huge expenses. Then you have uh, more values about the transmission. For example, <coughs> blood transfusion. Notice that blood transfusion has the highest rate of infection per transfusion, almost one to one, okay? 9,250 per every 10,000 blood transfusions that contain the virus, okay? Infected sources. Needle sharing, 63 out of 10,000. Uh, 10, okay. In intravenous drug abusers, even they have a low rate of transmission. Here we have the unprotected anal sex, unprotected um, penile vaginal sex, eight out of 10,000. And notice percutaneous needle stick injury, 23 out of 10,000 exposures to an infected source. So when we have a needle stick, we don't have to panic immediately, okay? <laughs> we have to simply go have a test and take the post-exposure prophylaxis during the time time that will decrease very importantly the amount of, uh, the, the risk of infection. Yeah. I just had a quick question. They, um, these numbers, are these US only or are these? This is from one study that I found. Okay. The other ones, the other ones are from other studies, so maybe there is a little. Because that seems like a really high number for the blood transfusion, doesn't it? Yeah, I can't find the source. Well, if you have a blood transfusion with HIV. But, but they but they test. No, 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 is no, this, no. Is Listen, this, is this is not what is of no, no, no. Contracting. No. Ten thousand infected. Okay. okay. I'm not saying that here in the USA we have this amount of of HIV that's transmission. What I, that's what I was asking. No, no. If you have ten thousand. Uh, people who are blood, blood, blood with HIV, and you, we use this blood uh, in the blood transfusion, most of them are going to get infected. Mm -hmm. These 10,000 are not the ones that are there. These are infected. All right. Okay? These are people who have exposure to an infected source. Okay? okay? This is infected blood. Okay? It's Understand? It's still a lot, yeah. Yeah, no, of course it's a lot. <laughs> in mind that you are having... I'm just saying it's a big 500, number. 500, if you have a needle stick, what you have in, in, inside your body? Not even a drop. Right. Because if you have gloves, etc., you are squeezing the needle. Okay, so whatever is a micro something. But if you have 500 ml of blood with HIV in your blood... <laughs> blue, 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 blue. <laughs> right, but my question was, all the blood that is donated here in the U.S. Of is course. tested, so but this but is imagine, a high number. This but imagine you go to the That's island, why I was asking, an island in some place, somewhere else. you go to a place where they don't take care of the blood, right. and they have 10,000 uh, liters of infected blood, and they start doing trans transfusions, just, right. these people are going to get infected. Okay. Okay. That is infected source. Okay, I'm not talking about statistics of how much HIV is transmitted by transfusions. Okay. okay. Gotcha. They, they knowingly expose 9,250 people to uh, HIV infected blood. How did they get that? Yeah.
Yeah, they did an experiment. <laughs> <laughs> 10,000 infected. And no, no, no. These are calculations, okay? Because remember, this is simply a calculation done for you to compare if people are exposed to 10,000 infected sources by different routes, what is the risk of transmission? These are mathematical calculations. Okay, notice that per 1,000 is common to all of the routes of infection. So you can have an idea of what is the risk. If there is a blood transmission, if there is a needle stick, if there is a, a unprotected sex, or if there is different things. Okay. The potential of getting the disease. The potential. Almost always in the blood transfusion, very low possibility in uh, unprotected, receptive, that's the female, that is uh, unprotected sex. Okay. Okay. I understand. No. I also told it's for you to compare out of 10,000, right. what is the probability in different routes of infection. Got it. Who was going to ask? Um, okay, sir, I just had a question. So if a person things like uh, rashes and specific rashes that differentiate the flu from the HIV infection. But normally when they start having symptoms, they will have what we call the B-type symptoms, okay? fevers and night sweats, weight loss, rashes on specific rashes, persistent oral thrush or ulcerations, chronic diarrhea, the key word here is persistent. Persistent or worsening. Okay? Non-responsive to treatment. And the key words here. Headaches. People can have changes in the mental status. Some disorders like generalized lymphadenopathy. And also signs of some of the AIDS design, uh, defining illnesses. Okay, rashes and scars, for example, herpes zoster. Eruptions, fungal infections, Kaposi sarcoma, the infadenopathies in the physical exam, oral thrush or hairy leukoplakia, 
We are going to show some pictures of these things. Pneumonias, remember the opportunistic infections, pneumocystis, carini pneumonia, and evidence of other sexually transmitted diseases. One thing that I forgot to tell you, um, when someone has a sexually transmitted infection, for example, like this, okay? Let's imagine these are the, this is the mucous membrane of the vagina, of the rectum, of the penis of a person. Maybe in a healthy person there are some dendritic cells that are looking, watching, and monitoring the health status. Okay? Once a person has herpes or any other inflammatory condition in the genitalia, the inflammatory reaction attracts inflammatory cells. And there is a point in which the body mounts like a surveillance system and the amount of dendritic cells increases a lot. Okay? In the case of the healthy person, imagine this is a person who never has had a herpes. And one day has an unprotected sexual encounter okay, with a person that has HIV. HIV enters here, in between the epithelial cells, and maybe enters here, and enters here, and here, and here, and dies. Becomes ineffective with time. Now, if HIV enters here, it will fuse with the dendritic cell, and the dendritic cell is the one that is going to take the HIV to the lymph nodes and initiate the infection. Now, compare the possibilities or the odds of getting HIV in a person who has never had a sexually transmitted infection with the odds or the risk or the probabilities of having HIV in a person who has had a herpes. Doesn't matter where the HIV enters, it will find a dendritic cell. Okay, so people who have had a sexually transmitted disease before are a lot at a higher risk of getting infection than those who have never had. So oral thrush, disseminated persistent oral thrush, it's common that if, if we take antibiotics, or if we are very, very stressed or certain conditions, we can develop some thrush that goes away with treatment or without treatment sometimes. But if you have oral thrush and you give treatment and the thrush appears in the uvula, in the pharynx, and if you look in the esophagus, there is thrush as well, that is not normal. And it doesn't go away, and it gets worse. Hey, leukoplakia, which is a lesion that is called by Epstein-Barr virus in the presence of immunodeficiency. This can progress and become a cancer, okay? Cytomegalovirus retinitis is a medical emergency that requires, <coughs> requires immediate referral for saving the vision of this person. Aftos stomatitis, ulcers, aftos lesions. And the key word is persistent, okay, persistent. Herpes simplex, ulcerated lesions, notice in the ears. Herpes simplex, notice, I'm, I'm sure many of us have had a cold sore, herpes lesion that maybe takes, sometimes it looks, looks ugly, but doesn't go beyond this area more or less, maybe it can go spread a little bit. Mm. Notice the extension of this herpes lesion, and it's acyclovir resistant, resistant to treatment, okay? In cases of healthy people, they put some alcohol, Abriva or any any treatment and will go away in some days. This is resistant to acyclovir. Kaposi sarcoma, remember these are tumors of the blood vessels. Okay. Produced by uh, the presence of herpes virus 8 in cases of immunodeficiency. Varicella zoster. One thing that characterizes varicella zoster in people with HIV is the uh, that it affects several dermatomes. When we develop shingles, okay, there is normally one dermatome that is affected. Okay? If you see someone with several dermatomes affected, in the arms, in the trunk, in the legs, maybe in the ear, in the eye, at the same time, that is a sign of immunosuppression. This is a chronic papillar lesion okay, in the face. Is, uh, my memory is failing. 
umbilicate the lesion with the caseus plug in the center. Molluscus. Molluscus contagiosum. A widespread and resistant molluscus, con molluscus contagiosum. Because having a child with a molluscus contagiosum might be normal because, okay, or someone who goes to a gym, etc., and gets this for a while, but a persistent widespread in someone can be a sign of uh, HIV or any other immunosuppression. And MRSA, okay, resistant infections with MRSA okay, that get worse and worse and worse and don't respond to treatment, okay, don't respond to anything. That is another thing. In medicine, you are going to go beyond this. And the most important thing in medicine is know, depending on the level of the CD4 cells, what is the most likely infection that can appear? Okay, when the CD4 cell goes beyond 200, when it goes beyond 150, below 100, below 50, or beyond that. <coughs> because you have to give the patient certain antibiotics to prevent opportunistic infections. Okay, that is probably the most important thing that you have to remember about HIV in, in medicine. And of course, the highly active antiretroviral therapy. What medications, in what combination, what is the first medication that you give, or the first combination of medications, what to do depending on if the patient has comorbidities like kidney failure or something else because some of them are contraindicated or some of them depending on the geographic area are going to change etc but that is for medicine so i think we are done mm -hmm. i finished one hour before then <laughs> Okay, so there is a quiz. I'm oh, sorry, Adam. Uh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>